Section 13 of Astounding Stories 20, August 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. Astounding Stories 20, August 1931 The Port of Missing Plains by Captain S. P. Meek Part 1 So that's the Port of Missing Plains, mused Dick Purdy as he looked down over the side of his cockpit. It looks wild and desolate, all right, but at that I can't fancy a bus cracking up here and not being found pronto. Gosh! Wilder crashed in the wildest part of Arizona, and he was found in a week. The mail plane droned monotonously on through perfect flying weather. Purdy continued to study the ground. Recently transferred from a western run, he was getting his first glimpse of that section of ill repute. Below him stretched a desolate, almost uninhabited stretch of country. By looking back, he could see Belfonte a few miles behind him, but Phillipsburg, the next spot marked on his map, was not yet visible. Twelve hundred feet below him ran a silver line of water, which his map told him was Little Mushannon Run. As he watched, he suddenly realized that the ground was not slipping by under him as rapidly as it should. He glanced at his airspeed meter. What the dickens, he cried in surprise. For an hour his speed had remained almost constant at one hundred miles an hour. Without apparent cause it had dropped to forty, less than flying speed. He realized that he was falling. A glance at his altimeter confirmed the impression. The needle had dropped four hundred feet and was slowly moving towards sea level. With an exclamation of alarm, Purdy advanced his throttle until the three motors of his plane roared at full capacity. For a moment his airspeed picked up, but the gain was only momentary. As he watched, the meter dropped to zero, although the propeller still whirled at top speed. His altimeter showed that he was gradually losing elevation. He stood up and looked over the side of his plane. The ground below him was stationary as far forward progress was concerned, but it was slowly rising to meet him. He fumbled at the release ring of his parachute, but another glance at the ground made him hesitate. It was not more than three hundred feet below him. I must be dreaming, he cried. The ground was no longer stationary. For some unexplained reason he was going backward. The motors were still roaring at top speed. Purdy dropped back into his seat in the cockpit. With his ailerons set for maximum lift, he coaxed every possible revolution from his laboring motors. For several minutes he strained at the controls before he cast a quick glance over the side. His backward speed had accelerated, and the ground was less than fifty feet below him. It was too close for a parachute jump. As soon as I'm falling, I won't crack much anyway, he consoled himself. He reached for his switch, and the roar of the motors died away in silence. The plane gave a sickening lurch backward and down for an instant. Purdy again leaned over the side. He was no longer going either forward or back, but was sinking slowly down. He looked at the ground directly under him. A cry of horror came from his lips. He sat back, moping his brow. Another glance over the side brought an expression of terror to his white face, and he reached for the heavy automatic pistol which hung by the side of the control seat. He cleared Belafonte at nine in the morning, Dr. Birds, said Inspector Dolan of the post office department, and headed towards Phillipsburg. He never arrived. By ten we were alarmed, and by eleven we had planes out searching for him. 
They reported nothing. He must have come to grief within a rather restricted area. So we sent search parties out at once. That was two weeks ago yesterday. No trace of either him or his plane has been found. The flying conditions were good. Perfect also. Purdy is above suspicion. He has been flying the mail on the western runs for three years. This is his first accident. He was carrying nothing of unusual value. Are there any local conditions unfavorable to flying? None at all. It is much uninhabited country, but there is no reason why it shouldn't be safe country to fly over. There are some damnably unfavorable local conditions, doctor, although I can't tell you what they are, broke in operative Carnes of the United States Secret Service. Dick Purdy was rather more than an acquaintance of mine. After he was lost, I looked into the record of that section a little. It is known among aviators as the Port of Missing Planes. How did it get a name like that? from the number of unexplained and unexplainable accidents that happened right there. Dugan of the air mail was lost there last May. They found the mail bags where he had dropped them before he crashed. But they never found a trace of him or his plane. They didn't? Not a trace. The same thing happened when Mayfield cracked in August. He made a jump and broke his neck in the landing. He was found all right, but his ship wasn't. Tearson, of the army, dropped there, and his plane was never found. Neither was he. He was seen to go down in a forced landing. He was flying last in a formation. As soon as he went down, the other ships turned back and circled over the ground where he should have fallen. They saw nothing. Search parties found no trace of either him or his ship. Those are the best known cases, but I have heard rumors of several private ships which have gone down in that district and have never been seen or heard of since. Dr. Bird sat forward with a glitter in his piercing black eyes. Carnes gave a grunt of satisfaction. He knew the meaning of that glitter. The doctor's interest had been fully aroused. Inspector Dolan, said Dr. Bird sharply, why didn't you tell me those things? Well, doctor, we don't like to talk about mail wrecks any more than we have to. Of course, the loss of so many planes in one area is merely a coincidence. Probably the wrecked planes were stolen as souvenirs. Such things happen, you know. Fiddlesticks, said Dr. Beard sharply. He raised one long slender hand with beautifully mottled tapered fingers and threw back his unruly mop of black hair. His square, almost rugged jaw protruded, and the glitter in his eyes grew in intensity. No souvenir hunting vandals could cart away whole planes without leaving a trace. In that case, what became of the bodies? No, Inspector. This has gone beyond the range of coincidence. There is some mystery here, and it needs looking into. Fortunately, my work at the Bureau of Standards is in such shape that I can safely leave it. I intend to devote my entire time to clearing this matter up. The ramifications may run deeper than either you or I suspect. Please have all your records dealing with plane disappearances or wrecks in that locality sent to my office at once. The post office inspector stiffened. Of course, Dr. Bird, he said formally. We are very glad to hear any suggestion that you may care to offer. When it comes, however, to a matter of surrendering control of a post office matter to the Department of Commerce or to the Treasury Department, I doubt the propriety. Our records are confidential ones and are not open to everyone who is curious. I will inform the proper authorities of your desire to help, but I doubt seriously if they will avail themselves of your offer. Dr. Bird's black eyes shot fire. Idiot, he said. If you're a specimen of the post office department, I'll have the entire case taken out of your hands. Do you mean to cooperate with me or not? 
I fail to see what interest the Bureau of Standards can have in the affair. The Bureau isn't mixed up in it. Dr. Bird is. If necessary, I will go direct to the President. Oh, thunder! What's the use of talking to you? Who's your chief? Chief Inspector Watkins is in charge of all investigations. Carnes, get him on the telephone. Tell him we are taking charge of the investigation. If he bulks, have Bolton go over his head. Then get the chief of the Air Corps on the wire and arrange for an army plane tomorrow. There is something more than a mail robbery back of this, or I'm badly fooled. Do you suspect... I suspect nothing and no one, Carnes, yet. I'll get a few instruments together to take with us tomorrow. We'll fly over that section until something happens, if it takes us until this time next year. A three-seated scout plane rose from Langley Field at eight the next morning. Captain Garland was at the controls. In the rear cockpit sat Dr. Bird and Carnes. Inside his flying helmet, the doctor wore a pair of headphones which were connected to a box on the floor before him. Carnes carried no apparatus, but his hand rested carelessly on the grip of a machine gun. The plane cleared Bellefonte at 9.30 and bore east towards Phillipsburg. Captain Garland kept his eyes on his instrument board and on a map. Less than 600 feet above the ground, he was following the air mail route as exactly as possible. Overhead, a mail plane winged its way east, 3,000 feet above them. Fifteen minutes brought them to Phillipsburg. Captain Garland shot his plane upward a few hundred feet. Turn back, Captain, said Dr. Bird into the speaking tubes. Retrace your course a quarter of a mile farther north. At Bellefonte, turn back and go over the same ground another quarter of a mile north. Keep flying back and forth, working your way north, until I tell you to stop. The plane swung around and headed back towards Bellefonte. Of course we can't tell exactly what route he followed, said the doctor to Carnes. But he was new on this run, and it's safe to assume that he didn't stray far. We'll quarter the whole area before we stop. Carnes watched the ground below them carefully. There was nothing about it to distinguish it from any other wooded mountainous country, and his interest waned. He glanced aloft. The mail plane had disappeared in the distance, and the sky was clear of aircraft. He turned again to the ground. It looked closer than it had before. He turned and looked at the duplicate altimeter. The plane had lost nearly a hundred feet elevation. There's something wrong about this plane, Doctor, came Captain Garland's voice through the speaking tube. It doesn't behave like it should. I guess we've found out what we're looking for, Carnes, said Dr. Bird grimly. What seems to be the matter, Captain? Blessed if I know, was the answer. It felt like a drag of some sort, like an automobile going through heavy sand. We're slowing down, though I am giving her all the gun I've got. Cut your motor, said the doctor shortly. He bent over the duplicate instrument board as the roar of the motor died away. Carnes rose and looked over the side. Look, doctor, he cried in a strained voice. Directly below them yawned a hole sixty feet in diameter and extending down into the bowels of the earth. The plane hovered over the hole for a moment and then slowly descended into it. What is it? cried the detective. It's the secret of the port of missing planes, replied Dr. Bird. Throw off your parachute. Keep your gun and light handy, but don't fire unless I do first. The same holds good for you, Captain. The plane sunk until it was fifty feet below the level of the ground. Carnes looked up. Gradually the circle of sky became blurred and hazy as though the air were heavy with dust. The rasp of Dr. Bird's flashlight key aroused him, and he hastily wound his own. The haze above them grew thicker. Suddenly the light died, and then came darkness, a darkness so thick and absolute that it bore down on them like a weight. 
Dr. Bird's light stabbed a path through it. They were in a tunnel or tube reaching into the ground. The sides were smooth and polished, as though water-worn. The plane sank deeper and deeper into the earth. Suddenly Dr. Bird's light went out. "'What's the matter?' Doctor asked Carnes. "'Did your light fail?' No, came a strained voice. I turned it out. Why? I don't know. Light yours. Carnes reached into his pocket. Dr. Bird could hear his breath coming in panting sobs as though he were exerting his whole strength. I can't do it, doctor, he gasped. I want to, but some power greater than my will prevents me. Are you affected, captain? asked the doctor. I can't move came in muffled accent from the front cockpit some power beyond my knowledge has us in its grasp said the doctor all we can do is sit tight and see what happens we are no longer falling at any rate from the forward cockpit came a rustling sound there was a slight jar in the ship and it gave as though a weight had been applied to one side what are you doing garland asked the doctor sharply there was no reply again came the rustling sound the ship gave a sudden lurch as though a weight had left the side carnes suddenly spoke good-bye doctor he said i'm going over the side i have been fighting it but i'm going myself in a minute replied the doctor grimly something is pulling me over it's the same power that keeps me from turning on my light it's perfectly safe to go over said carnes suddenly the plane is resting on a solid base i have the same feeling catch hold of my belt and let's go they climbed over the side of the plane and dropped to the ground their descent made absolutely no sound dr bird stopped and felt the floor crepe rubber or something of the sort he murmured at any rate it's noise and vibration proof now what asked carnes this way replied the doctor confidently i'm beginning to get the hang of understanding this the way is perfectly level and open before us keep your hand on my shoulder and step right out how do you know where we're going i don't but something tells me that the road is level and open it is the same thing that brought us over the side i can't explain it but it's some sort of a telepathic control exerted by an intelligence whether the sending mine is reinforced by instruments i don't know but i rather fancy not where is garland he went off in another direction i could feel the power that guided him although it was not directed at us something tells me that he is safe for the present for half a mile they made their way through the darkness before they stopped this time carnes could plainly understand the command which came to both of them there is a table before us said dr bird lay your flashlight and pistol on it carnes struggled against the order but the power guiding him was stronger than his will he strove to turn on his light when he could not he tried to cock his pistol with a sigh he laid his gun and light on the table before him without words the two men walked forward a few feet and sat confidently down on a bench that something told them was there for a moment they sat quietly a cry choked in the middle came from the detective's throat cold clammy hands touched his face he strove again to cry out but his voice was paralyzed the hands went methodically over his body evidently searching for weapons mustering up his will carnes made a grab for one of them his captor apparently had no objection to the detective's action for carnes seized the hand without effort but he almost dropped it the hand was as large as a ham he reached out for the other hand but could not locate it a movement on the part of his captor brought it to him and he made the startling discovery that the palms were directed outward the hand had only four fingers which were armed with long curved claws instead of nails carnes ran his hand up the palm to search for a thumb but found none he found however that while the hands were naked the wrists were covered with short thick fur doctor he cried there's 
again came the overpowering will and his speech died away in silence he sat dumb and motionless while his captor moved over to dr bird a second animal came forward and felt the detective over he was not allowed to move this time nor was he while a third and fourth animal went carefully over him the four drew back some distance doctor whispered carnes as the influence grew fainter Shh, was the answer and as the doctor demanded for silence it was reinforced by another wave of paralyzing power carnes had no choice as he sat there silent the power which held him again seemed to grow less he found that he could move his arms slightly he edged forward to get his gun in light before he reached them a beam of light split the darkness dr bird stood electric torch in hand staring before him at a distance of a few feet stood a group of half a dozen animals about the height of a man as they stood erect on their short hind legs they were covered with heavy brown fur their lower limbs were thin and light but their shoulders and forelegs were heavy and powerful their forepaws which had the palms facing outward were armed with the long wicked claws he had felt no visible ears protruded from the round skulls their heads appeared to rest between their shoulders so short were their necks their muzzles were long and obtusely pointed through grinning jaws could be seen powerful white teeth talipidae cried dr bird carnes they are a race of giant intellectual moles despite the fact that they had no visible eyes the creatures were strongly affected by the light they dropped on all fours and turned their backs to the scientist and the detective two of them scurried away down a long tunnel which opened from the room in which they stood dr bird turned his light up and swept the room it was roughly circular a hundred feet in diameter with a roof ten feet high dozens of tunnels led off in every direction your light carnes quick cried the doctor in a strained voice carnes reached towards the table for his light before he could reach it he was frozen into immobility from the corner of his eye he could watch the doctor dr bird was struggling to bring the light back on the moles which stood before them great beads of sweat stood out on his forehead inch by inch he moved the light closer to his goal but carnes could see that his thumb was stealing up towards the switch button his breath came in sobs suddenly the light went out for some time the two men sat motionless on the bench unable to speak or move one of the moles stepped forward before them and gave a mental command the two rose to their feet for a mile or more they followed their guide then at a silent command they turned to the right for a few steps and stopped in another moment the numbing influence had departed are you all right carnes yes right as can be doctor what were those things where are we what is it all about we'll find out in time i guess replied the doctor with a chuckle carnes isn't this the darndest thing we've ever been through captured half a mile underground by a race of giant talpidies before whose mental orders we are as helpless as children did you understand any of their talk talk i didn't hear any well mental conversation then they made no sound no all i understood was the orders i obeyed end of chapter thirteen part one the port of missing planes